Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this uh, reading and discussion of Ambrose Bierce, the, uh, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Now, just uh, by way of introduction, uh, Ambrose Bierce was an American journalist, short story writer, and Civil War veteran, as you uh, may know. I did send out a couple of links with uh, information uh, about his life and work. Uh, Ambrose Bierce was born in 1842, and he died around 19. 14. In 1913, at age 71, he went to Mexico, and uh, the circumstances are uh, unknown. It's thought that he may have uh, joined up with Pancho Villa, the uh, Mexican revolutionary, and got involved with that, but he disappeared, and uh, his fate is unknown. It's a very interesting uh, life story and an interesting Fate. Ambrose Bierce is known for his biting social criticism and satire, while his work, his later work, became cynical and often gruesome and so sardonic and bitter that he uh, became known by the nickname or the moniker of Bitter Bierce. And perhaps his best known example of this. Uh, bitterness, this scathing satire, is The Devil's Dictionary, which was first published in 1906. Most of Bierce's stories were written and published in the 1880s and uh, 1890s. He was a contemporary of Mark Twain, whose uh, short story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, we uh, read and talked about last time. And uh, his stories often draw from his Civil War experiences, and his war stories uh, influence Stephen Crane, uh, Ernest Hemingway, and others. In, uh, if you read the uh, articles that I sent, you see that Bierce ha had harrowing experiences in the Civil War. He was on the battlefront, and he saw a lot of uh, men killed and wounded. In 1864, in the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain in Georgia, uh, Bierce was shot in the head and survived. He later said that the bullet, quote, crushed my skull like a broken walnut. So again, the Civil War really molded him as a person and as a writer, and uh, of course we see this in a, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. And he is also uh, ranked highly as a writer of horror stories, uh, along with H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe. <clears throat> an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge has been called one of the most famous and frequently anthologized stories in American literature, and novelist Kurt Vonnegut, who uh, was a World War II uh, veteran and saw action in that war, uh, has called uh, the Owl Creek Bridge the greatest American short story. Now, my interest in the story dates from seeing the short film version that was screened on American television as an episode of The Twilight Zone in uh, 1964. And maybe some of you uh, can, can relate to that. Um, I, I, I was 14 <laughs> in 1964, but I do, I do remember that, uh, that, that episode. And it, it's, it, it's a story, it's a film that, uh, that stays, stays with you. And I did send out a, uh, a five and a half minute clip of that uh, film. It's about maybe 20 minutes long tops, and it's, uh, which is about the length of time it takes to, to read the story. And it, I think it really captures the, uh, the, the essence of the story, and it, it shows the synergy of um, film and, and fiction, so we, we can appreciate 
uh, the story and the film even more when, when we uh, by ex each by experiencing them both. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, start uh, with the reading. Now, can we assume that everybody would like to take a turn reading? Okay, let, let, let's do it that way, and uh, we'll just uh, start, and uh, we'll go around, and I'll let, let you read for a paragraph or two, and, and then I'll say stop, and then we'll go to the next person, and then we'll have our discussion uh, after that. And, and if you have any questions, uh, yeah, keep, keep Keep those in mind because there, there certainly are uh, questions that, that this story uh, brings up. So let's see. Uh, Martin, would you like to uh, start us off? Now, everyone has a copy of the story that I sent out, right? <clears throat> and I also sent out uh, some questions to uh, consider in, uh, in reading and discussing the story. So you, you might have that those questions at hand also. Okay, uh, Martin, go ahead. And don't forget to unmute yourselves, please, when you, uh, when, when, when you start reading, because we don't, we don't want to miss a word. <laughs> okay. Okay, Martin. Okay, Bill. An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge by Ambrose Pierce. A man stood upon a railroad bridge in northern Alabama, looking down into the swift water 20 feet below. The man's hands were behind his back, the wrists bound with a cord. A rope closely encircled his neck. It was attached to a stout cross timber above his head, and the slack fell to the level of his knees. Some loose boards laid upon the ties supporting the rails of the railway supplied a footing for him and his executioners. Two private soldiers of the Federal Army, directed by a sergeant who in civil life may have been a deputy sheriff. At a short remove upon the same temporary platform was an officer in the uniform of his rank, armed. He was a captain. A sentinel at each end of the bridge stood with his rifle in the position known as support. That is to say, vertical in front of the left shoulder, the hammer resting on the forearm thrown straight across the chest, a formal and unnatural position, enforcing an erect carriage of the body. It did not appear to be the duty of these two men to know what was occurring at the center of the bridge. They merely blockaded the two ends of the foot planking that traversed it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let's have uh, the next reader. How about uh, Mary Horn? You want to read? Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, I didn't finish uh, downloading the text, so oh, uh, I I don't have it here. Oh, okay. Well, then let's just switch over to Diane. You want to read next, Diane? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Beyond one of the sentinels, nobody was in sight. The railroad ran straight away into a forest for a hundred yards, then curving was lost to view. Doubtless there was an outpost further along. The other bank of the stream was uh, open ground, a gentle slope topped with a stockade of vertical tree trunks, loopholed for rifles, with a single embrasure through which protruded the muscle of a brass cannon commanding the bridge. Midway up the slope between the bridge and the fort were the spectators, a single company of infantry in line at parade rest, the butts of the rifles on the ground, the barrels inclining slightly backwards against the right shoulder, the hands crossed upon the stock. A lieutenant stood at the right of the line, the point of his sword upon the ground his left hand resting upon his right. Accepting the group of four at the center of the bridge, not a man moved. The company faced the bridge, staring stoningly motionless. The sentinels faced the banks of the stream, might have been statues to adorn the bridge. 
The captain stood with folded arms, silent, observing the work of his subordinates, but making no sign. Death is a dignitary who, when he comes announced, is to be received with formal manifestations of respect, even by those most familiar with him. In the code of military etiquette, etiquette, silence and fixity are forms of deference. Okay, thank you. Let's see, Dwayne, you want to take the next paragraph or two? Certainly. The man who was engaged in being hanged was apparently about 35 years of age. He was a civilian. If one might judge from his habit, which was that of a planter, his features were good. A straight nose, firm mouth, broad forehead, from which his long dark, dark hair was combed straight back falling behind his ears to the collar of his well-fitting frock coat. He wore a mustache and pointed beard, but no whiskers. His eyes were large and dark gray and had a kindly expression, which one would hardly have expected in one whose neck was in the hemp. Evidently, this was no vulgar assassin. The liberal military code makes provisions for hanging many kinds of persons, and gentlemen are not excluded. The preparations being complete, the two private soldiers stepped aside and each drew away the plank upon which he had been standing. The sergeant turned to the captain, saluted, and placed himself immediately behind that officer, who in turn moved apart one pace. These movements left the condemned man and the sergeant standing on the two ends of the same plank, which spanned three of the cross ties of the bridge. The end upon which the civilian stood almost, but not quite, reached a fourth. This plank had been held in place by the weight of the captain. It was now held by that of the sergeant. At a signal from the former, the latter would step aside, the plank would tilt, and the condemned man go down between two ties. The arrangement commended itself to his judgment as simple and effective. His face had not been... Uh, uh, covered, nor his eyes bandaged. He looked a minute at his steadfast footing, then let his gaze wander to the swirling water of the stream racing madly beneath his feet. A piece of dancing driftwood caught his attention, and his eyes followed it down the current. How slowly it appeared to move. What a sluggish stream. Okay, thank you. Marilyn, how about you? Okay. He closed his eyes in order to fix his last thoughts upon his wife and children. The water touched to gold by the early sun, the brooding mists under the banks at some distance down the stream, the fort, the soldiers, the piece of drift, all had distracted him. And now he became conscious of a new disturbance, striking through the thought of his dear ones, was, a, was sound which he could neither ignore nor understand. A sharp, distinct, metallic percussion like the stroke of a blacksmith's hammer upon the anvil. It had the same ringing quality. He wondered what it was and whether immeasurably distant or nearby. It seemed both. Its reoccurrence was regular, but as slow as the tolling of a, of a death knell. He awaited each new stroke with impatience, and he knew not why. Apprehension. The intervals of silence grew progressively longer. The delays became maddening. With their greater infrequency, the sounds increased in strength and sharpness. They hurt his ear like the thrust of a knife. He feared he would shriek. What he heard was the ticking of his watch. He unclosed his eyes and saw again the water below him. If I could free my hands, he thought, I might throw off the noose and spring into the stream. By diving, I could evade the bullets and swimming vigorously reach the bank, take to the woods and get away home. My home, thank God, as it yet out, is as yet outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invader's farthest advance. As these thoughts, which have here to be set down in words, 
were flashed into the doomed man's brain rather than evolved from it. The captain nodded to the sergeant. The sergeant, sergeant stepped aside. Okay, thank you. Let's see, Catherine, how about you? I had to go where it was more quiet. Um, okay. Peyton Farquhar was a well-to-do planter of an old and highly respected Alabama family. Being a slave owner, and like other slave owners, a politician, he was naturally an original secessionist and ardently devoted to the Southern cause. Circumstances of an imperious nature, which it is unnecessary to relate here, had prevented him from taking service with that gallant army which had fought the disastrous campaigns ending with the fall of Corinth. And he chafed under the inglorious restraint, longing for the release of his energies, the larger life of the soldier, the opportunity for a distinction. That opportunity, he felt, would come as it comes to all in wartime. Meanwhile, he did what he could. No service was too humble for him to perform in the aid of the South, no adventure too perilous for him to undertake, if consistent with the character of a civilian who was at heart a soldier, and who in good faith and without too much qualification, assented to at least a part of the frankly villainous dictum, which is, all is fair in love and war. One evening, while Farquhar and his wife were sitting on a rustic bench near the entrance to his grounds, a gray clad soldier rode up to the gate and asked for a drink of water. Mrs. Farquhar was only too happy to serve him with her own white hands. While she was fetching the water, her husband approached the dusty horseman and inquired eagerly for news from the front. The okay. Yanks. Oh. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah okay. great. Thanks. Okay, Bruce, you, you want to take, take, take us through the, uh, the rest of that section? Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. The Yanks are repairing the railroads, said the man, and are getting ready for another advance. They've reached the Owl Creek Bridge, put it in order, and built a stockade on the north bank. The Commandant has issued an order, which is posted everywhere, declaring that any civilian caught interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be summarily hanged. I saw the order. How far is it to the Owl Creek Bridge, Farquhar asked. About 30 miles. Is there no force on this side of the creek? Only a picket post half a mile out on the railroad and a single sentinel at this end of the bridge. Suppose a man, a civilian and student of hanging, should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the sentinel, said Farquhar, smiling. What could he accomplish? The soldier reflected. I was there a month ago, he replied. I observed that the flood of last winter had lodged a great quantity of driftwood against the wooden pier at this end of the bridge. It's now dry and would burn like tinder. The lady had now brought the water, which the soldier drank. He thanked her ceremoniously, bowed to her husband, and rode away. An hour later, after nightfall, he repassed the plantation, going northward in the direction from which he had come. He was a federal scout. Okay, thank you. Uh, Susan? Okay. As Peyton Farquhar fell straight downward through the bridge, he lost consciousness and was as one already dead. From this state, he was awakened ages later it seemed to him, by the pain of a sharp pressure upon his throat, followed by a sense of suffocation. Keen, poignant agony seemed to shoot from his neck downward through every fiber of his body and limbs. These pains appeared to flash along well-defined lines of ramification and to beat with an inconceivably rapid period peri periodicity. They seemed like streams of pulsating fire heating him to an intolerable temperature. As to his head, he was conscious of nothing but a feeling of fullness, of congestion. These sensations were unaccompanied by thought. The intellectual part of his nature was already effaced. 
He had power only to feel, and feeling was torment. He was conscious of motion, encompassed in a luminous cloud, of which he was now merely the fiery heart, without material substance. He swung through unthinkable arcs of oscillation, like a vast pendulum. Then, all at once, with terrible suddenness, the light about him shot upward with the noise of a loud splash. A frightful roaring was in his ears, and all was cold and dark. The power of thought was restored. He knew that the rope had broken, and he had fallen into the stream. There was no additional strangulation. The noose about his neck was already suffocating him and kept the water from his lungs. To die of hanging at the bottom of a river, the idea seemed to him ludicrous. He opened his eyes in the darkness and saw above him a gleam of light. But how distant, how inaccessible. He was still sinking, for the light became fainter and fainter until it was a mere glimmer. Then it began to grow and brighten, and he knew that he was rising toward the surface. Knew it with reluctance, for he was now very comfortable. To be hanged and drowned, he thought, that is not so bad, but I do not wish to be shot. No, I will not be shot. That is not fair. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Catherine, you want to take a turn? Isn't, isn't there a second, Catherine? Uh, Catherine Bake. Yes, Catherine. I'm right here. Okay. He was not conscious of an effort, but a sharp pain in his wrist apprised him that he was trying to free his hands. He gave the struggle his attention, as an idler might observe the feat of a juggler, without interest in the outcome. What splendid effort, what magnificent, what superhuman strength. Ah, that was a fine endeavor. Bravo, the cord fell away. His arms parted and floated upward, the hands dim dimly seen on each side in the growing light. He watched them with a new interest as first one and then the other pounced upon the noose at his neck. They tore it away and thrust it fiercely aside, its undulations resembling those of a water snake. Put it back, put it back, he thought. He shouted these words into his hands, for the undoing of the noose had been succeeded by the direst pang that he had yet experienced. His neck ached horribly. His brain was on fire. His heart, which had been fluttering faintly, gave a great leap, trying to force itself out of its mouth. His whole body was racked and wrenched with an insupportable anguish, but his disobedient hands gave no heed to the command. They beat the water vigorously with quick downward strokes, forcing him to the surface. He felt his head emerge. His eyes were blinded by the sunlight. His chest expanded convulsively and with a supreme and, and crowning agony, his lungs engulfed a great draft of air, which instantly he expelled in a shriek. He was now in full possession of his physical senses. They were indeed preternaturally uh, keen and alert. Something in the awful disturbance of his organic system had so exalted and refined them that they made record of things never before perceived. He felt the ripples upon his face and heard their separate sounds as they struck. He looked at the forest on the bank of the stream, saw the individual trees, the leaves and the veining of each leaf. He saw the very insects upon them, the locusts, the brilliant bodied flies, the gray spiders stretching their webs from twig to twig. He noted the prismatic colors in all the dewdrops dew upon a million blades of grass, the humming of the gnats that danced above the eddies of the stream the beating of the dragonfly's wings, the strokes of the water spider's legs, like oars which had lifted their boat. All of these made audible music. A fish slid along beneath his eyes, and he heard the rush of its body parting the water. Okay, good, thank you. Let's see, let's have uh, Joanne, are, are you there? Joanne Brignolo, are you there? Uh, how about Christina? What do I do? Jo are you there, uh, Joanne? You have to unmute. <clears throat> there's a there's a mute button in the lower I'm left. Sorry. Do you see it there? Go ahead. I'm. Uh, 
Well, we can hear you, kind of. Video mute. I'm so sorry. I don't know. Uh, this is my first time. Whoops. I know what I did. Oh, well, we can hear you. You you wanna you I wanna go a, ahead? I, the I went ahead. And I, I lost the video or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm showing. This is Sasha. Um, your I'm getting a message that your bandwidth is very low, so your 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 um your video is not coming through. Okay, uh, I, I'll just cut off. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Okay, thank <laughs> okay. you. Okay, okay. Now, Christina. Uh, somebody just sent a chat. Let's see. Uh, okay, Christine is just listening. Okay, she's enjoying it. Very good. Okay, <clears throat> well, I think I'm going to read. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, I'll just read uh, a paragraph or two. He had come to the surface facing... Is that, the, is that where we are? I just lost my place. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you all. <laughs> he had come to the surface facing down the stream. In a moment the visible world seemed to wheel slowly around, himself the pivotal point, and he saw the bridge, the fort, the soldiers upon the bridge, the captain, the sergeant, the two privates, his executioners. They were in silhouette against the blue sky. They shouted and gesticulated, pointing at it. The captain had drawn his pistol but did not fire. The others were unarmed. Their movements were grotesque and horrible, their forms gigantic. Suddenly he heard a sharp report and something struck the water smartly within a few inches of his head, spattering his face with spray. He heard a second report and saw one of the sentinels with his rifle at his shoulder, a light cloud of blue smoke rising from the muzzle. The man in the water saw the eye of the man on the bridge gazing into his own through the sights of the rifle. He observed that it was a gray eye and remembered having read that gray eyes were keenest and that all famous marksmen had them. Nevertheless, this one had missed. Okay, M Mary, did you want to try it this time? No? Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, Martin, let's go back to you. A counter swirl had caught Fakir and turned him half round. He was again looking at the forest on the bank opposite the fort. The sound of a clear, high voice and a monotonous sing-song now rang out behind him and came across the water with a distinctness that pierced and subdued all other sounds, even the beating of the ripples in his ears. Although no soldier, he had frequented camps enough to know the dreadful significance of that deliberate, drawling, aspirated chant. The lieutenant on shore was taking a part in the morning's work. How coldly and pitilessly, with what an even calm intonation, presaging and enforcing tranquility in the men. With what accurately measured interval fell those cruel words. Company, attention, shoulder arms, ready, aim, fire. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, Dwayne? Farquhar dived, dived as deeply as he could. The water roared in his ears like the voice of Niagara. Yet he heard the dull thunder of the volley and, rising again toward the surface, met shiny bits of metal, singularly flattened, oscillating slowly downward. Some of them touched him on the face and hands, then fell away, continuing their descent. One lodged between his collar and neck. It was uncomfortably warm and he snatched it out. As he rode to the surface, gasping for breath, he saw that he had been a long time underwater. 
He was perceptibly further downstream, nearer safety. The soldiers had almost finished reloading. The metal ramrods flashed all at once in the sunshine as they were drawn from the barrels, turned in the air, and thrust into their sockets. The two sentinels fired again, independently and ineffectually. The hunted man saw all this over his shoulder, and he was now swimming vigorously with the current. His brain was as energetic as his arms and legs. He thought with the rapidity of lightning. Okay, great. Marilyn? Okay. The officer, he reasoned, will not make that Martinet's error a second time. It is as easy to dodge a volley as a single shot. He has probably already given the command to fire at will. God help me, I cannot dodge them all. An appalling splash within two yards of him was followed by a loud rushing sound, diminuendo, which seemed to travel back through the air to the fort and died in an explosion which stir stirred the very river to its depths, deeps. A rising sheet of water curved over him, fell down upon him, blinded him, strangled him. The cannon had taken a hand and hand in the game. As he shook his head free from the commotion of the smitten water, he heard the deflected shot humming through the air ahead. And in an instant, it was cracking and smashing the branches in the forest beyond. They will not do that again, he thought. The next time they will use a change of grape. I must keep my eye on the gun. The smoke will apprise me. The report arrives too late. It lags behind the missile. That is a good gun. Okay, thanks. Catherine, you want to read again? <clears throat> Thank you. Suddenly, he found himself whirled round and round, spinning like a top. The water, the banks, the forest, the now distant bridge, fort and men, all were commingled and blurred. Objects were represented by their colors only. Circular horizontal streaks of color, that was all he saw. He had made them, oh, he had been, sorry, he had been caught in a vortex and was being whirled on with a velocity of advance and gyration that made him giddy and sick. In a few moments, he was flung upon the gravel at the foot of the left bank of the stream, the southern bank, and behind a projecting point which concealed him from his enemies. The sudden arrest of his position, the abrasion of one of his hands on the gravel, restored him, and he wept with delight. He dug his fingers into the sand, threw it over himself in handfuls, and audibly blessed it. It looked like diamonds, rubies, emeralds. He could think of nothing beautiful which it did not resemble. The trees upon the bank were giant garden plants. He noted a definite, definite order in their arrangement, inhaled the fragrance of their blooms. A strange roseate light shone through the spaces among their trunks, and the wind made in their branches the music of Aeolian harps. He had not wished to perfect his escape. He was content to remain in that enchanting spot until retaken. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bruce? <clears throat> a whiz and a rattle of grape shot among the branches high above his head roused him from his dream. The baffled cannoneer had fired him a random farewell. He sprang to his feet, rushed up the sloping bank, and plunged into the forest. All that day he traveled, laying his course by the rounding sun. The forest seemed interminable. Nowhere did he discover a break in it, not even a woodman's road. He had not known that he lived in so wild a region. There was something uncanny in the revelation. By nightfall, he was fatigued, footsore, famished. The thought of his wife and children urged him on. At last, he found a road which led him in what he knew to be the right direction. It was as wide and straight as a city street, yet it seemed untraveled. No fields bordered it, no dwelling anywhere. Not so much as the barking of a dog suggested human habitation. The black bodies of the trees formed a straight wall on both sides, terminating on the horizon in a point, like a diagram in a lesson in perspective. Overhead, as he looked up through this rift in the wood, shone great golden stars looking unfamiliar and grouped in strange constellations. 
He was sure they were arranged in some order which had a secret and malign significance. The wood on either side was full of singular noises, among which once, twice, and again, he distinctly heard whispers in an unknown tongue. Okay. Thank you. Catherine? His neck was in pain, and lifting his hand to it found it horribly swollen. He knew that it had a circle of black where the rope had bruised it. His eyes felt congested. He could no longer close them. His tongue was swollen with thirst. He relieved its fever by thrusting it forward from between his teeth and into the cold air. How softly the turf had carpeted the untraveled avenue. He could no longer feel the roadway beneath his teeth, feet. <laughs> Doubtless, despite his suffering, he had fallen asleep while walking, for now he sees another scene. Perhaps he has merely recovered from a delirium. He stands at the gate of his own home. All is as he left it, and all bright and beautiful in the morning sunshine. He must have traveled the entire night. As he pushes open the gate and passes up the wide white walk, he sees a flutter of female gar garments. His wife, looking fresh and cool and sweet, steps down from the veranda to meet him. At the bottom of the steps, she stands waiting with a smile of ineffable joy, an attitude of matchless grace and dignity. Ah, how beautiful she is. He springs forward with extended arms, and he is about to clasp her. He feels a stunning blow upon the back of his neck. A blinding white light blazes all about him with a sound like the shock of a cannon then all is darkness and silence. Peyton Farquhar was dead. His body with a broken neck swung gently from side to side beneath the timbers of the Owl Creek Bridge. Hmm. Give ourselves a hand. Nah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, thank you all very much. Is, it, is this the first time for reading the the story of anyone? Is the ending a surprise? You need to unmute, Catherine. Uh, to uh, me, it was I, a surprise. But, um, but then um, on the second reading, I could see that you know, if you read carefully, you could tell it wasn't that he was in a dream, more or less. Can you can you point out some of the details that that tell you that? Um, ha, ha, well, when he says he could, um, when he says he could see everything on the bank, you know, the, when he could see the veins in the leaves and hear the dragonflies and see the, oh, and, and, and also the, um, seeing the gray eye of the, um, sharpshooter. I mean, okay. that, those were, those were uh, clues that he wasn't, it wasn't reality. By the way, that, that gray eye of the marksman uh, mm -hmm. r r made me think of the evil eye. And mm. maybe if, if we can ask the question, is the story uh, making any kind of statement about, uh, about capital punishment? That if we have the gray eye of the executioner, you know, maybe it, it could be seen as an evil eye. I, I think he also had gray eyes. I'm looking for the place where they describe him. And uh, yeah, they said his features were good. And it goes on, he had, his eyes were large and dark gray and had a kindly expression, which one would hardly have expected in one whose neck was in the hem. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so they kind of have a... a, a a kinship with the eye color. Well, are, are there any other uh, reactions or takes on the story? Yes, Catherine? 
Hi. Uh, well, this is my first time reading the story. I, I had downloaded it, but I thought it'd be better not to read it. I'd rather just hear everyone reading to me. And um, it struck me as I was listening that the final paragraph is an abrupt uh, present time. So it's the most present and, and uh, um, it's the most in reality, in a sense, except that he's dead. So the reality is that he's dead. And uh, the other is kind of like a historical account. Um, and I just thought that was a nice tool of the writer to sort of smack you forward in the final paragraph into a strange state. And we find out that, that, that all of the action is uh, a, an illusion, that it's all taken place mm. uh, I inside the head of... Uh, Peyton Farquhar in how long? Just uh, a, a second or two? It's all mm -hmm. been co collapsed mm -hmm. in, into just uh, a flash. I also think, I just wanted to say that um, the, the last section was a surprise because the middle section for me has to do with anyone who has escaped death, um, sees colors more brightly and smells things and appreciates the shapes of things, the very immediacy of the beautiful world. And it seemed to me that that was a, a realistic telling of how one feels when you escape death. That, that's a good point. I, I think a good example of that is, is on page four, the second paragraph from the bottom where he's, uh, he's in full possession of his physical sense. Is, yeah. It's a kind of a, a hyper awareness, uh, this um, appreciation of, of the life that is about to be taken away. <clears throat> and the description of the, uh, the locusts, the, the brilliant body flies, the gray spiders, the, the prismatic colors in all the dewdrops upon a million blades of grass. It's almost. Uh, uh, to me, it's almost hallucinogenic. I have one last thing to say on that point. Just one last thing is that uh, the final chapter of Cormac McCarthy's The Road is like that, where there's this telling of all the things that happened to him and his son traveling across America. And the final chapter has to do with the way that the light looks on the fish, fish's skin. And it's really abrupt in its re reality feeling and noticing of tiny, beautiful details of the world. There's also kind of a religious feeling to it, like it happens in this last paragraph. And uh, um, I think because Cormac McCarthy wrote it after this, he might have been struck by this uh, technique in the story or other stories like that. Could, Maybe. Like, <laughs> yeah, good. A anyone else? Yeah. Martin? One of the things that really struck me, this is my first time reading it as well, <clears throat> but of course this week and the last few weeks we've had a lot of discussion with the Black Lives Matter movement and we have the um, taking down of Confederate memorials. And I was kind of thinking of this story in that context of being written by a man who I was surprised was actually a union soldier, but he's almost sort of taking up the cause of the lost cause. You have sort of the gentleman planter representing the South, and we see him talking about referring to the invaders, um, the fact that uh, he's entrapped by federal forces. You know, he's somebody who wasn't inclined to do wrong, meaning blowing up the bridge, but he's sort of entrapped into, uh, into doing something by the, by the federal forces. And then even uh, when he was going through the woods, He's talking about this sort of a nightmarish world where he's wandering through a forest with black bodies on either side of him. And I don't know, it just, that's kind of what really struck me about it. I kept thinking, and, you know, again, the first time I read it was just about an hour before we, we got together, thinking about this is almost an, an allegory of the Civil War, but but interestingly told from the perspective, I think, of the defeated South. Um, right. So that was just my, my sense of it. Right. Well, speaking of that um, entrapment, because he, uh, Farquhar 
it is entrapped by that Union Scout. But of course, Farquhar doesn't know it's a Union Scout. And so on, on page three, the man says, the Yanks, this is on the second paragraph, the Yanks are repairing the railroads and are getting ready for another advance. And uh, he goes on, uh, the, the commandant has issued an order which is posted everywhere declaring that any civilian caught interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be summarily hanged. I saw the order. So Farquhar knows the consequences of, of, of anything that, that he does. So, uh, and, and he, he apparently, he has acted in defiance of this order, right? But, but we don't know that for sure. The, the text doesn't re really say what Farquhar did, but implicitly he, uh, he tried to burn down the bridge. But so he, he acted in defiance of this order. So here's a question. Do we feel any less sympathy for him knowing that he has brought the hanging on himself? If, if he had not tried to sabotage the bridge, he would, he would live. Of course, there would be no story. <laughs> but uh, do, do, do we find, uh, do we have sympathy for Peyton uh, Farquhar? Yes, Catherine? Well, one, uh, one thing he says is, suppose a man, a civilian and student of hanging. So, he obviously knows what hanging is all about. And you wonder, is that because of his slaves or other means? Um, but that was one, um, one thing not in his favor, I guess. But I mean, I, I still would have sympathy for him, especially after seeing the, uh, the Twilight Zone. Um, feature that was you know seeing that his face and you know it was it's I would really definitely well. have sympathy for him oh that was well done exactly like uh, but uh, yeah I um, I was interested in that the way he said that civilian and student of hanging Okay. So Bruce? I just, did anybody else have any comment about that? Well, let's see, yeah. Bruce, you, uh, okay, Bruce and then Susan. Yeah, so I feel like um, it was interesting that you mentioned that Hemingway was influenced by him because I think that what Hemingway and, and Bierce also bring out is the inhumanity of war. And you can sort of sympathize with anybody who's thrown into this world of kill or be killed um, doesn't matter if you're on the north or the south side these men are basically fighting for their lives and are in a situation that's just completely um, inhumane and ridiculous and I think Kurt Vonnegut wrote a lot about that too in Slaughterhouse Five and all his other books but um, I wanted to just go back to one thing you talked about before about this unreality um, you know, he talks about the watch ticking, and the watch is basically um, maybe a metaphor for time running out or something. Um, but the, I read a couple of Pierce's other pieces, and time comes up again and again. There's a story about a soldier who is um, trapped under a building that has fallen around him that was blown up. And he wakes up and he's laying there and there's a barrel of a rifle pointing straight at his face and it's his own rifle that he's been buried with. And the amount of time that takes place between when the building collapses on him and when the officers find him um, and he find him dead is something like 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But the telling of the story makes it go on and on and on and you would think it was an eternity. So he likes to play with time, and he, he likes to use time in a very significant way. 
which I think is, is really interesting. Okay. Good. Susan? Um, well, on that last point, um, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of how dreams are. I, I don't know if you have had the experience, like not when you were lying down in bed in a proper place, but you were somewhere and you were just so tired and you just drifted off to sleep. And you could have a pretty lengthy feeling and complete dream and, and wake up and realize you'd only been asleep like two minutes. And sometimes dreams are like that. But what I wanted to say was the setup for this was sort of mysterious. And um, I, at, going back to the point about would we think he was at fault or not, it's, it's never explained. He says it's not necessary to go into hear what the, uh, the circumstances of imperious nature are that kept them from serving in the, in the war. Well, I'll tell you, they were taking everybody. They were taking little kids and old men. So I, I can't even imagine what the circumstances were. But it's so obvious that he, he's not serving, but he just feels like somebody's going to come along. He was really eager for it, you know, as long as it was respectable for a civilian who wasn't actually a soldier to do. I mean, he was just, he was longing. that He wasn't trapped, but he was longing for some, somebody to point out something he could do. So in that sense, yeah, I think he got what he deserved. Now, on that point of what, why the circumstances uh, prevent, prevented him from, uh, from taking service uh, with, the, uh, with the Army, I was interested in that, too. <clears throat> and I did, I looked into it, I did some uh, research, and I've and I come across it uh, elsewhere, but in, um, the, in the 1862, the... Confederate Congress enacted uh, legislation that became known as the 20 Negro Law or uh, the 20 Slave Law. And th this was uh, a, a law to exempt from Confederate military service one white man for every 20 slaves owned on a Confederate plantation. So this law uh, arose from a, a, a fear that uh, there could be a slave rebellion uh, doing, uh, uh, due to so many white men uh, being away and uh, fighting in the army. So they wanted to have at, at least one white man for, for every 20 slaves on the plantation. So I, I just wonder if, if that's what's being referenced uh, here because... Mm because it, 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 he, Faith and Farquhar is, is, he seems to be a fairly well-to-do uh, aristocrat plantation owner, and, and it, it's, he certainly could have at least 20 slaves. And, and also, uh, to uh, place this uh, in the Civil War, that in uh, Section 2, there's a reference to the, uh, the, the fall of Corinth, it's uh, about the fifth line down. He, uh, so there's a, a, a reference to the siege of Corinth. Uh, this was a battle that took place in May and April, 1862, uh, resulting in uh, a defeat of the Confederates and uh, a capture of the town by the Union Army. So the, the Union Army was, was the invader of the South, and this is <clears throat> this shows that, and it, it and it shows how the civilians get 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 swept up uh, into it, and the, the inhumanity of it. Mm. Well, no wonder he didn't want to go into that. Uh, the reason why <clears throat> he was not, not joining the other soldiers. That's very interesting, but. I mean, getting into that would would create a whole other storyline. My my um, first reaction when I finished it was that was the most descriptive um, writing of a hanging that I'd ever heard. I mean, I could just. You, it, it was like he'd almost experienced being hung, you know, he, the fear and the, 
you know, the, what goes through his mind. And it was, I thought, a very amazing writing that he did. Right. There, there are many, many, many telling uh, details. Mm. Any other uh, comments? <clears throat> I, I wanted to uh, share something. I read the story a number of uh, times, and I was thinking this time in particular about the title. And uh, three things about the title of a story or any story. Uh, first of all, the title tells what happens in the story. The title is the story in a nutshell. And second, <clears throat> the, the title uses literal and figurative language to impart meaning and raise questions. And the third thing is the title is often overlooked or taken for granted. So let me share with you <clears throat> my, my parsing, <clears throat> excuse me, my parsing of the title. Bear with me. Okay, so look at the first word, occurrence. Occurrence is an act or instance of occurring, uh, something uh, that takes place, but it's a, uh, it's a general term, and I, I, I think it's, um, shows the use of understatement, which is a form of irony in which something is uh, intentionally represented as uh, less than a fact it is. So, uh, so it, it would be an understatement to say that uh, the, it, the uh, assassination of Abraham Lincoln uh, was an occurrence at uh, Ford's Theater. Uh, so, so uh, occurrence, uh, it, 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 it's an understatement of, of, what, of what happens. Now, then owl. An owl is a nocturnal bird of prey. And it, it's also a creature of flight. So th there are uh, connotations of darkness and flight all throughout uh, the story. The owl is also uh, associated with um, foreboding. So uh, uh, as a kind of a bad sign. So we've got the owl made functioning uh, figuratively there. And then uh, a creek. Now, a creek is a small stream, often a shallow or intermittent uh, tributary to a river. Now, in, in the story, when he falls into the, into the water, he, he goes down and down and down. And when I think of a creek, I, I think of uh, maybe two or three feet deep uh, at, at the most, maybe, you know, get maybe four or five, but certainly uh, not enough to, to swim around in. Uh, so uh, that, uh, the question, if you have that handy, uh, do you, that's question nine. Do you uh, think the portrayal of Farquhar's escape and final thoughts is realistic? Consider his heightened, hyper-realistic senses, his ability to dodge gunfire, his family, and so forth. What, 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 was it really realistic for him to imagine that if he hit <laughs> the water, that, that, he, that it, he would be able to get away? Because it, it, it really would not, a creek would not be deep enough to sustain his uh, escape. Plus, uh, the word creek is used idiomatically and informally in the phrase up a creek or up a creek without a paddle, meaning, uh, according to my American Heritage uh, Dictionary, in a difficult, unfortunate, or inextricable position, which, which certainly uh, fits the, uh, the situation with uh, 
Peyton Farquhar. And then uh, five, uh, yeah. Uh, on the creek, just um, good, good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. And, and then finally, the bridge. So a bridge is a structure spanning and providing passage over a gap or barrier such as a, a river or a roadway. So we have the physical bridge in the, uh, in the story, but then maybe the bridge functions figuratively or symbolically. It, it, it symbolizes a passage or a crossover from life to death. So, you know, we have, we have life and death, and, and, and this story kind of bridges the two. And similarly, we have in the story a separation of body and soul. And, and the, the story kind of brings together or, you know, it joins these, con bridges these concepts of body and soul. So uh, in, in the title, every word of the title kind of, uh, <laughs> brings up the meaning of the story. Does that make sense? Mm. One one of the fun mm -hmm. things about one of the fun things about this is I get to heart uh, back to my days uh, decades ago as an English prof. <laughs> so I, I can <laughs> I, so I know it's academic, but I had to I had to get that in. So did somebody else have a comment? <laughs> yes, yeah, Catherine. Okay. Me, Kathy. Yeah, um, um, I think you make a good point because um, we see again in the end, it really snaps us to attention of the uh, the pathos of his um, insignificance in his death. It's just an occurrence. It's just nothing. Like Bruce said, it's just it's just something in war. It's just not all these people are nothing on either side when they're just part of a regimented death. But in the end. You see all his joy coming forward. He appreciates his wife and coming home and all that joy. And then in the very end sentence, he's just someone with a rope on his neck. He's just nothing. Yeah. The, the, the and, word. You know, and, that, and that crossover on the bridge, I felt that too. You know, it's the bridge to, to his, his, his joyful death in a sense because he comes back to you know, call it God, call it crossing over, call it whatever it is. He comes to his kind of um, rejuvenation in a sense, but he's really just a body. It's just nothing. It's just going to yeah. float down a creek, a crick. <laughs> and, so I and, thought, yeah, I thought that was good what you said, yeah. And, and so it's, I guess another title could have been a tragedy at Owl Creek Bridge. Mm. But then that. But he sort of, he sort of finds his, he finds his greatest moment in his joy of, of realizing what his life was. I mean, he loves, he loves his life in a sense, but he didn't so, really occur to him before, I don't think. Do, do you see joy? I think in those few seconds, he has, he has an awareness and joy, but because the body really isn't that important. What's important is who he is as a man then that's true of all the soldiers that die, all the nobodies are really somebodies in a certain sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very good. Yes, Martin. I think um, Beers in portraying this guy is, is kind of criticizing his grandiosity as well, you know, Cutting back to the description of his imperious nature, which we don't have, need to get into, and you know his sensation that somehow that he could, uh, you know, escape the the hangman's noose essentially by jumping into the water and getting away. Uh, yeah, I think I think that at first I thought you know Pierce was being a little overly sympathetic to this person but thinking that he's kind of setting him up and saying you know this is what becomes of people who have no real sense of reality <laughs> uh, that they're that 
he's really deluded and he's extremely naive at the end of the day. Peyton. Peyton Farquhar. Yeah, Peyton, yeah. Oh, yes, Mary. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, Mayor, Mary Horn. Marilyn. I, I enjoyed the reading very much. I thought the use of the word occurrence made the happening extremely impersonal. It didn't seem to wish to ap apply guilt or innocence. It was simply, it happened. And after that, we just go on. But I agree that he felt joy at the end. Hmm. Okay. Now, Marilyn? I was just going to say I thought it was interesting that he um, chose to focus this story on the, on the southern slave owner when he himself was such a staunch supporter of the Union cause and fought in, in the Civil War on the, on the other side. And um, so I, I thought it was kind of curious because I, I did think it was sympathetic toward, toward Farquhar, but but maybe, uh, maybe he didn't mean it to be that sympathetic. I don't know, but I just thought it was curious that he, he chose to focus in such detail uh, on, on this southern slave owner. Mm. Oh. Yeah, and uh, and he, Farquhar is the only civilian in the story. He's mm -hmm. caught up in, in the fighting between these two sides. Well, oh, Dwayne? That... Dwayne? Well, I thought it was interesting in that they, this particular story was written in 1890, so many years after the Civil War, and, but yet was so uh, intricate and detailed along the way. And I think that perhaps uh, Mr. Beers, like uh, uh, Mr. Twain, had a change of attitude about war during that particular time. We you know that uh, Mark Twain uh, wrote about being a Confederate soldier for two weeks early before the war started, but by the end he wrote something called the War Poem, which was definitely anti-war along the way. But the things that were going on in, with him in 1890 is also remarkable in that uh, he was in the throes of about ready to divorce his wife, a couple of his kids had committed suicide. So uh, I think he was sort of uh, uh, yielding to some of the pressures and he was letting off a little steam. Uh, he, there's a wonderful biography you probably came across about him. It's called Alone in Bad Company. And that pretty much yeah. seems uh, to be what Mr. Beers was uh, during his last 20 years. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, Catherine? Uh, I, I thought it was interesting when he was talking about, when he was standing on the bridge before he was hung, he says, uh, it says, he unclosed his eyes. And I'd never heard that before. You know, it's always he opened his eyes, but this is he unclosed his eyes. And can you shed any light on that particular phrasing? What paragraph is that? It's right before um, section two. Right before section two. Oh, he unclosed his eyes. The, and so he unclosed <clears throat> his eyes. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, instead of, O opening his eyes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? This is Diane. Um, I wondered about that too, but then I just noticed right now when she mentioned that, that the paragraph before that, the second word is he closed his eyes. So I don't know if that has any bearing or not, but do you see the oh. paragraph before? Yeah. Good, good observation. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe that's just a way of uh, counterbalancing the, 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 the paragraphs, a, a form of uh, mm -hmm. 
parallel structure and 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 uh, use mm -hmm. of uh, use of repetition there to to uh, move the story forward. Yeah, yeah I, that's. I have a I have a question to ask uh, you and everyone. Uh, usually, there's a plot, and I couldn't really think of the plot. I can think of the themes, the themes of as somebody mentioned, time and space and whatnot. What, does anybody, could, when, I, when I ever go to a play or a movie, I try to think afterwards in a word or at the most a phrase what it was about. But it's awfully difficult to just sort of define this piece in a word or two. Does anybody have any ideas on that? I don't know about that point, but looking at these two paragraphs, I think when it ends, what he heard was the ticking of his watch. That's actually the end of the story. When he opens his eyes, I mean, he probably doesn't open his eyes because he said he wanted to fix his last thoughts upon his wife and children. And that's probably what happened. And then he was hanged. So this whole part from he unclosed his eyes and saw again the water before him, probably nothing of that. Probably that's all the, the, the last moment thoughts that flashed through his mind before he died. You see what I'm saying? We probably could go from this paragraph, mm. close his eyes, to the last paragraph. He was hanged. And everything else that happened in between was his dream or his last thoughts or, you know, the vision. Because his last thoughts actually were his wife and children, as he said. Right. And, and Bruce, Bruce you, you were talking earlier about the time element uh, with the ticking watch and, and so forth. But the, the, their shifts back and forth in time in the story from from present uh, to the past and then back uh, and then back to the present but i think it's <clears throat> as far as a plot is concerned it's just the uh, the, the the fantasy of the escape it, it's it's the mind i guess one the, the human mind wanting to hang on to life uh you know, it's kind of a sta statement on the on the preciousness of life, which is heightened when it's about to be taken away. Mm. And yeah, I would I would agree with that. There, there was one other thing I that I I wanted to uh, that I noticed uh, toward the end. Let's see, it's at the bottom of page six. Bottom of page six. Where am I? That uh, it starts. The, it's the paragraph that starts doubtless, and uh, all uh, up until this last paragraph, uh, it, everything it is in the past tense. So he's traveling, he's running, he's, he's getting away. Um, his neck was in pain and lifting his hand to it, he found it horribly swollen. Uh, doubtless, despite his suffering, he had fallen asleep while, while walking. For now he sees another scene. Perhaps he has merely recovered from a delirium. Uh, and it changes from the past tense to the present tense, it kind of, it kind of builds up to a, to a crescendo, or it, it, it increases the, um, the the momentum. He stands uh, at the gate of his own home. All is as he left it, and all bright and beautiful in the morning sunshine. He must have traveled the entire night, and then for for this penultimate paragraph, he, he pushes open the gate. Uh, and, and by the way, if you saw the short story, uh, uh, the film version, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty clear that it's the gates of heaven. <laughs> it's, it's symbolic. But, uh, uh, you know, he pushes open the gate. He passes up the wide white walk. He sees a flutter of female gardens, garments. Uh, his wife steps down from the veranda. She stands waiting. Uh, and then it, it, it's all in the present tense there, and, it, and all is darkness and silence. Pretty, pretty powerful there at, at the end. 
So, okay. Well, I don't want to. Uh, we've been going on pretty well here. I, we, I guess we, we could keep going, but uh, I want to respect everyone's schedules. So, does anybody have a parting uh, comment? So, was it helpful? Did did did, did this uh, add to our understanding and appreciation? People get something out of it. I just want to say thank you. It's a pretty thoughtful group of people. Oh, great. Well, thanks a lot for joining us, Catherine. I, okay. Thanks well, thank much. you, everyone. Very good job. Thank you. And uh, take care. Yeah. Stay well. Mm -hmm.